Let's try that again. Good morning. Happy Sabbath, everyone. We are glad that you are here. Um, a special welcome to those that are joining us online. We wish you were here in person, but we are glad that you are joining us online. Um, what I would like you to do is I would like you to look around the room. I'd like you to find someone you haven't said hi yet to. I'd like you to wave to them. Connect eyes with someone. Wave to someone. Tell them hi. Once again, welcome. We are glad that you are here. Um, a couple announcements for you. If you have not heard, um, for today, we originally had it on there that we were going to be doing a potluck. That has been postponed. Stay tuned for our next date for our all church potluck. Also, uh, in a couple weeks, in October 9th, that's in two weeks, we will be having our October mosaic, and we would love to see you there. So mosaic in a couple weeks, and our potluck for today was postponed. Once again, welcome. We are glad that you are here. At this time, we are going to move into our children's story. So could I have all the kiddos come up front and meet me up here? Today we are going to play a guessing game. I'm going to do two movements, and you're going to try to guess what we're talking about today. You ready? I'm going to put my mic down. Say it one more time. God's love. We're going to be talking about God's love today. So I need a volunteer. Andy, you want to come home? All right. So. What I have here is I have an empty cup. This is going to represent someone else. So this could be mom, this could be dad, this could be a friend. This is someone else. I have a sponge here, and what this is going to represent is you. This is you, and the water that is in the sponge represents the love that you have to give to that other person. Now, what I want what I want you to do is I want you to take the water that is in the sponge and try to get as much water as you can into that cup. Go. And then you're going to hold it up for everyone to see. I think you did pretty good. Yeah. All right. Now I'm going to need a second volunteer for our next part. Now, Aiden, you pulled from what was in the sponge because that was the love that you had to give. But what if we pulled from an endless supply or a bigger supply of God's love. How much do you think we could get this cup filled? Let's try it. Do you want to try it? Here, I want you. I want you to take the sponge. I want you to dip it in there. And squeeze it on your finger. That's one sponge full, two sponge full, three sponge fulls, four, five, six, keep going. 
seven. Do you think you could get it a little more full? I think you can. Keep going. One more. Good job. All right. And this cup, you ready to hold it up for everyone to see? Is overflowing. All right, go ahead and put it down. When we take and we give out of God's love, the love that God has for us and the love that God gives for us. Thank you very much. It becomes a lot more full, right? Look at this cup versus this cup. Which one is more full? This one, right? The cup that came from God's love. We can only give a, a little bit that we have when we come from our own resources. But when we tap into what God has for us, we can overflow and give love to those around us. Now, Pastor Larissa just remembered that her bag of goodies is in the other room. So I got to go grab that, but I will come find you. And what I have for you is Miss Keeney left me her mom bag and a dad bag. So we're going to go ahead and hand you something out of that. We'll do that in a moment, all right? You guys can head back to your seats right now. Would you please bow your heads with me with, in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of Sabbath that you would bring into your house men and women from all walks of life to worship you today. I pray that the poor, the rich, the downcast, the refugee, the single mother, the business owner, the sinners, and the saints would all gather today to sing the praises of your matchless name. I pray that our worship today would be different. I pray that it would be life-changing. I pray that the men and women of this congregation would look back on this day and know that it was a day where they encountered the living God. Father, wake up these people from their slumber. Wake me up. May our worship be awesome today. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everybody. Let us all rise and join in together singing praises to Jesus. Make it count, leave a mark, build a name for yourself. Dream your dreams, chase your heart above all else. Make a name the world. an empty world can sell his empty dreams. I got lost in the lie that it was up to me. Make a name the world All the kingdoms built, all the trophies won, will crumble into dust when it's said and done. Cause all that really matters. Did I live the truth to the ones I love? Was my life the proof that there is only one whose name will last forever? Oh 
I love that guy's smile at the end. That's the way we should be feeling when we're experiencing fruitfulness. Amen? Good morning, church. How are we doing this fine morning? Really? Because you don't sound very convincing. So, you're doing good? All right, awesome. Very cool. We're going to be continuing our series on Galatians chapter 5. This morning, uh, 5, 22, and 23, which talks about the fruit of the Spirit. And uh, we started it last week. We kind of talked a little bit in general of what it means to have the fruit of the Spirit. We talked about how it's just one fruit with nine different characteristics and how those nine characteristics is something that really tells God, it tells the world that really we are believers. And we're going to continue on this. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that there has never been a time in history of humanity, never, when this quality was not a priority for believers, the one we're going to be talking about today. From Adam and Eve to present time, God has had one mission, 
one message, one undertaking. That's really been the key of everything that we're all about. And that message that, that he has given believers through the chronicles of time, the, the one charge, the one purpose, the only holy objective is to declare that God is love. Three simple words. God is what? Love. We are told in uh, 1 John that anyone who does not love does not know God. Because God is what? Love. If God is love and you don't love, there is no way on earth that you can know God. Now, you could say, well, of course I love, right? Well, maybe. Let's talk about that. Let's find out whether you really love. Let's find out whether we really, truly love. There is a wonderful series of books called the Conflict of the Ages series. Anybody ever heard of this series of books? It's, it's five volumes. I really enjoy them. They tell the history of the human journey from the origin of creation to the ultimate establishment of the kingdom of God. And the very first volume begins with these three words. God is love. And then the author continues to talk about it. And then through five different volumes... And if you've not read the Conflict of the Ages series, this is a great time to read it. It's fantastic. Uh, the author is just saying over and over and over again, God is love, God is love, God is love. And then the very last three words in the Conflict of the Ages series is God is love. So the author is sandwiching the whole history of humanity between these three words. God is love. God is love. How many here believe that God is love? Raise your hand if you believe that God is love. Beautiful. Now turn to the person next to you and say, God is love, and believe it or not, he actually loves you. Go ahead, say that to somebody. If you're far away, then, then just, just shout it. God is love, and believe it or not, God loves you. Now say it like you mean it, especially if you're a spouse. Okay, just God is love and, you know. God has been on a mission to love and to reconcile the world. And everything that once was broken is in the process of being fixed, of being restored, because that's what love does. Amen? I'm going to go out on the limb one more time. And say that there has never been a more crucial time in history than now to proclaim and to demonstrate in this world that God is love. In fact, the Apostle Paul in writing to Timothy writes these words. But you must realize that in the last days, the times will be full of danger. When is this? In the last days. The times will be full of danger. Now listen to carefully the way he words this, because I think you're going to see something pretty amazing here. He says, men will become utterly self-centered, greedy, for money, full of big words. They will be proud and contemptuous without any regard for what their parents taught them and grandparents and the grandparents before that. They will be utterly lacking in gratitude, purity, and normal human affection. When? In the last days. They will be men of unscrupulous speech and have no control of themselves. They will be passionate 
and unprincipled, treacherous, self-willed, and conceited, loving all the time what gives them pleasure instead of loving God in the last days. They will maintain a facade of religion, but their conduct will deny its validity. You must keep clear of people like this, Timothy. Because in the last days, that's what's going to happen. Does this sound familiar to you, by the way? Is it just me? Or have you been noticing that this world is becoming exactly the way Paul said it was going to be? I mean, this is unbelievable to me. And, and basically what he is talking about is a lack of love. They're going to call it love. They're going to act like it's love. But it's not love. It has nothing to do with love. In the Gospel of Matthew... Jesus has heard saying in the, in the last days that because of the increase of wickedness, the way he puts it is the love of many will grow cold. Have you noticed this? It's amazing to me. I see it when I go to the grocery store. I was on, on, a, on a flight two weeks ago. I think I told you about this, being on the flight next to Emily, who was very talkative and a wonderful, beautiful Christian. Uh, but I had to catch the next flight, and I only had like a 22-minute window to get to a whole different uh, gate in a whole different section of Atlanta Airport. And if you've ever been to Atlanta Airport, you know exactly what I'm talking about. In fact, I was pretty sure I wasn't going to make it. And there was a lady behind me also. Uh, same problem. So as soon as the, the plane taxied and, and stopped, we got up, got our bags, you know. And I am not a pushy guy. So I'm just hoping that people will get off the, the plane quick. But the lady behind me is like, hey, can we please, can you just, can you just go because I'm going to miss this flight I said, you know, I'm in the same boat. She goes, just don't worry. Just be nice to people and just say, hey, listen, can you please let us go. Here we go again. I'm waiting for the disco lights. Okay, so, and so, <laughs> there they are. <laughs> Thank you. I think they did that on purpose this time. All right, so then, uh, so then, so then I am, you know, kind of edging my way, and I've got my bag, and, 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 and the lady's there, and, and some guy is there, and he's like, where are you going? I'm like, sorry, I've, I've got a, a gate I've got to get to, and I think I'm going to miss my flight. He's like, you must be the only important person on this flight. And I'm like, no, no, I just, what time is your flight? He's like, that doesn't matter, you know. And I'm thinking, there was a time when people were nice to each other. So now I'm standing there, and the lady behind me is like, just tell them to get out of the way. Like, I'm not going to do that. Now, but it's not like I can go to the side and let her through. You've been on an airplane recently, haven't you? There is no side, and certainly there's no side for somebody my size. So I'm like, lady, there's no way. But, but then finally we get through to the next section. The next section, the guy says, another guy. He's like, where are you going? I'm like, sorry, i got a plane to catch. I'm going to miss it. He's like, we all got a plane to catch it. And I was like, that's it. I'm not saying nothing. I'm not doing anything else anymore. I'm not going. I was just shocked of how discourteous people were, how much they couldn't care less. Have you noticed this? Of course, it wasn't as bad as some of the people on other flights that had to get taped to their seats. Have you heard about that? I'm not sure I'd want to go that far. 
but I can see how difficult it is for some of these flight attendants to be dealing with some of these people that are just so, it's just about them, so entitled. We live in a world that's very, very entitled. And, and, and love is one of the deepest human needs of all. Yes, but it is also very misunderstood and misused concept. Isn't that true? We use this word like, it's, you know, I love my spouse, but I also love my car. And I really love that song. And I love that movie. And I love burritos. Right? And I love you. I mean, we use this word love, it's like, like it's anything, you know. But what are we really saying? Maybe we ought to be reserving this word love for something much more important. Maybe we ought to be using love when we really mean love. Instead of like very much. Like I like burritos very much. I like gnocchis very much. But I love my wife. I love my daughter. I love my God. Does that make sense? I love my church. I like that movie. I like that song. Really a lot. But I love the Richland Seventh-day Adventist Church and the people. Amen? Consider the following letter, love letter. Read, read this one. Dearest Jimmy, no words could ever express the great unhappiness I felt since breaking off your engagement. Please say you'll take me back. No one could ever take your place in my heart. So please forgive me. I love you. I love you. I love you. Yours forever, Marie. And P.S., congratulations on winning the state lottery. <laughs> the Apostle Paul calls it making noise. Have you ever read that? And any parents here privileged to have experienced the beginning stages of a child learning how to play an instrument, learning how to play guitar or piano, violin, I was, I was on the phone with a friend just a couple of days ago, and there was this blaring of a trumpet, trying. And he kept apologizing. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. My daughter is learning how to play the trumpet. Like, I don't apologize. But I knew what he meant. My own mother, poor old mother, had to endure hours of me playing the drums while she was cooking. And I just played and played when I was terrible. But she never said a word. She, she just said, good job. But I didn't know till later that her headaches came from me playing the drums. <laughs> when I first was beginning to play the drums, I was just what? Making noise. Have you ever caught yourself making noise? Paul says in uh, 1 Corinthians 13, which we know it as the what? The love chapter. Uh, I love what he says in the love chapter. He says, if I had the gift of being able to speak in other languages without learning them and could speak in every language there is in all heaven and earth, but didn't love others, I would what? I would only be making noise. He doesn't say, you know, if I could do that, I would be like amazing. And people would really like me. And I would be extremely successful. No, he says, if I would do that, but don't have love, I would be only making noise. If I could speak... The language of having no love, making noise, 
If you can see in the future and understand mysteries, no love making noise. If you have faith that moves mountains, no love making noise, he says. If you can give all to the poor, surrender your body to the flames, but you don't have love, you're just making noise. And i got to tell you something. I see it every day in every situation. People making believe that they love, but they're just making noise. And what Paul is saying is it doesn't matter how gifted you are if you don't have the fruit of love. It's not about the gifts, it's about the fruit. Turn to somebody next to you and say, you know what? It's not about the gift, it's about the fruit. Go ahead. I'm going to just accept that one. It's okay. You know. It's not about the gift. It's about the fruit. That's what Paul is saying here. There's this great, great story in the book of Acts. I, I love this story. We've actually talked about it uh, from a different perspective in, in, in other times. In fact, I, mean, I don't know how many of you remember the, the series we did, Unstoppable, about the story of the book of Acts. It's amazing stuff in there. And there's this story, and uh, it, it, it's, it's about a guy named Philip, and his best friend just got stoned to death. But Philip loves God. And, and Philip, is, it's, it's not going to deter him from doing what he believes the Holy Spirit is telling him to do. And that is to preach the gospel. So he goes to Samaria and he preaches the gospel. And then one day the Holy Spirit says, I want you to go to, to this man who's a eunuch. Let me read you, let me share with you the text. It says, the Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. And then, and this is the part I want you to think about, Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet and he said, do you understand what you are reading? In other words, he runs. Now, you have to understand, this is the middle of the day in the hot desert and Philip hears, you go to this guy in the chariot. This guy, by the way, is a eunuch. Now, in case you don't know what a eunuch is, it was a man that often would be born without all his equipment. Sometimes, when a family was poor, they would buy male children and then they would castrate them and make them eunuchs so that they could control them, kind of like sometimes they do to horses, if you know what I mean. And this man, we are told, was a eunuch. He is marginalized. He is stigmatized. We don't think about it this way. We just kind of read the story. We don't even realize it. But here is Philip, and he runs up to him. When is the last time that you ran to somebody to share the gospel with them? When is the last time, just, just this past summer, just think with me for a moment. When is the last time this past summer that you figuratively ran to somebody, even a friend, even somebody that agrees with you and, and has the same philosophy as you, and you ran to them and you shared the good news with them? Maybe even, even kind of walked over to them. Maybe you had lunch with When is the last time you actually did that? I don't want you to raise your hand and say, you know, no. I just want you to think about this question. In fact, let me raise the bar a little bit. When is the last time you did that with somebody that is marginalized, stigmatized, someone that is not accepted, someone that is not like you, doesn't believe like you politically, doesn't believe like you religiously, doesn't believe like you in any other way? They're just really different and I want you to think about today's culture, and I want you to think about those who are marginalized, those who feel left out, those who feel like they're not part of it. 
And I want you to say, when is the last time that I reached out to them? I got to tell you this. I'm sorry. I'm going to boast on my wife, but one of the amazing gifts that Nancy has is this a wonderful ability to reach out to people that are marginalized, to reach out to people that nobody else will love. And she has a way of getting people around her to do the same. It's amazing. She'll even, she'll leave, she's amazing with people that, that have wronged her, and she still loves them, and she still figures out a way to, 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 to minister to them. It's just, that's exactly what Paul is talking about. That's exactly what Philip does. When is the last time that you did that? Sometimes we carry this unpublished list of people that we don't think have even the right to know about God. Isn't that true? Can we be honest with each other? Many, many years ago, I was a brand new Christian. I told this story many years when I first got here. Which, by the way, this month is six years that I've been here. Can you believe that? It's a long time. But it was some years ago, uh, I, I, I told this story, so some of you guys that were here many years ago might remember a little bit of this story. But I was a brand new believer, and uh, I... You know, when you're brand new, you can't shut up Jesus and that person. You know, you know what I'm talking about? When you first hear the gospel, when you first are filled with the good news of Christ, you just want to tell everyone and everybody, like every, doesn't matter who they are, you want to tell them about Jesus. And I was. I was doing Bible studies. I was meeting with people. And it's kind of stuck with me. But this time there was a guy that came to church with one of my former girlfriends. A girl name was Joyce. And I had gone out with Joyce for like six years before Christ. And when we both became believers, we both felt like, yeah, this is probably not a good thing. And so we broke up. But then she brings another guy to church. And I wanted to be friends with I'll call him Bob and say, hey, Bob, how are you? But as he walked in, you know how you can sense when people are uneasy? And I could understand, you know, he's walking into a church. He's not a believer. He's probably feeling like, okay, I don't know who's here. I don't know if this church is friendly. I don't know what I, that's what I'm thinking he's thinking. And so I go, hi, Bob, how are you? And I, I go to shake his hand, and his hand still stay there. And I'm like, how's it going? And he just goes, mm, and walks. And Joyce says, you know, the universal sign for it. Don't worry about it. So then... I let it go, you know, and then that same afternoon we had potluck, and so I decided to bring some food and actually serve it to him. And the guy actually says to me, like, what do you want? So not nothing. I just wanted to welcome you. Thank you for being part of, you know, being here. You know, I wanted to know how you met Joyce. And he looks at me and he goes, you're Sergio, aren't you? And I'm like, yeah. So I know who you are, he said. And he basically was saying, I don't want any part of you. Well, I'm a stubborn kind of a guy. So every Sabbath I would, you know, reach out more and reach out more and reach out more. And, and he's like, you know what? Look, man, just leave me alone, you know. I know that you and Joyce had a thing. Now it's me and Joyce and I don't want to, you know, just leave, leave us alone, you know. And I'm like, Bob, what is, why are you so angry, like? And he says to me, he says, I know people like you, you know, nice suit, and, you know, you've probably been like this all your life. And I go, no, apparently Joyce hasn't told you much about us. I said, I had hair down to here. I'm a, I was a drummer in a rock band. My whole life was totally different. I began to tell my story, you know. And, and it began to work. He's like, really? I was like, yeah, man, listen, let me take you out to dinner. I will tell you all about it, you know, and... And he's like, okay. So I go and pick him up in my little Chevy Nova. 
Remember the Novas, by the way? Those powerful cars, man. That thing was like, vroom, you know, that thing can go. And, and I went to pick him up, and he's in the car with me. He's got a big smile on his face. We go back to my room before we go to the White Plains Diner to have our meal. And I'm like, come on, let me show you the drumsticks. I show him drumsticks. He's like, oh, wow, that's cool. They, you really did play drums. I, was like, I, sh- I got pictures, I said. Let me show you pictures. And, I, you know, he's going through the set of pictures. This is back in the days when pictures were on paper. You, you know. And so he's like, oh, man, look at this, man. And he's like, oh, and there's actually one of me smoking. You know, I was like, wow, that's really you. He's like, yeah, he goes. And then all of a sudden he goes through one picture and he gets, like, really serious. And I had forgotten that in that set of pictures was a picture of me and Joyce. And I'm like, oh, no, Bob, look, really, I don't really, look, look, look. <laughs> I ripped the picture in front of him. He's like, just take me home. I'm like, no, Bob, really, it's, okay. it's just a stupid picture. Like, it's kind of not, just take me home, take me home. I'm like, all right. So now we get in the car, and I am taking him home. But the whole time I'm thinking, you know, come on, you know. Suddenly, his whole persona changes. It was almost as if there was smoke coming out of his nose. Little horns popping up. Veins coming out of his neck. And he begins to speak to me in very colorful language. And like every other word was, you know, this, that, and blankety that, and this, that, and blankety that. And I'm sitting there going, "Uh uh-oh. And then I'm trying to think, okay, what do I do now? And I remember somebody telling me, you know, when when you feel like attacked by the enemy, sing a hymn. Bad idea. But I didn't know it. And so now I'm like, ah, there shall be showers of blessings. Showers of blessings. You know, and he's like, shut up. And I'm like, no, 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 no. And I get louder. He's like, stop it. You know, and I'm like, okay, okay, I better stop. And then he sees me, and I pull into the White Plains Diner. And I said, look, Bob, let's just go ahead and just talk through this. He goes, okay. So he gets out of the car, and I get out of my car, and he's walking around, he's walking around like this. Now, you have to understand, Bob was very buff. Found out later that he was living in a garage as a homeless person. And what he did most of the days was push-ups. And, I mean, I could just tell. He was angry. And so I'm like, if I get into a fight with this guy, I'm either going to end up in jail I'm going to end up dead. Neither one of those I appreciate. And so I'm like, Bob, what are you doing? What are you doing? He's like, come over here. Come over here. And I just kind of quickly step back into the car, close the door, lock all the doors. And he's going, open up. What are you doing? Open up. I'm going, Bob, relax. Calm down. I can't stay here. And I start backing up and going away. And he's, I could see him in the corner in the rear view mirror. Stop it. Who come back over here? And he's yelling. He's all red. And I could just see people are looking at him like he's nuts, you know. And I'm now driving away. And I do not, in one of those moments where I'm not hearing the voice of God audibly, I'm just knowing that God is saying to me, go back. No. I'm having this conversation with God. I need you to go back. No, God, you go back. I'm not going back. He's like, no, no, I need you to go back. I need you to go back and get Bob. I am not going. He's going to kill me. He won't kill you. Yes, he will. I'm telling you. He's not looking. You know, I'm having this. I'm like, okay, now I'm stupid. I'm talking to myself, right? But no, I'm actually talking to God back and forth. I feel this intense, intense, this need to go back. And I'm like, all right, all right. So I go back around the corner, and he's still there. And I pull up, and he's banging on the window. I go, calm down. I say, you calm down. I'll open the door. But if you don't come down, I can't open the door. And he's like, and he finally comes down. Okay. Like, now listen to me. I open this door. You're going to be nice, right? Yes. So I reluctantly opened the door. Bob came in, and once again, his whole persona changed. 
and he got very dark and calm and began to tell me about his life. We drove to the diner again and we sat till 2 o'clock in the morning, which is when the diner closed, talking about his life. I would, wouldn't have known about it then, but I think today we would have called him bipolar or manic depressive. I actually thought he was schizophrenic, quite honestly. So I began to gently reach out to him and love him. And one day I found out his birthday was coming up. And I got a whole youth group together in the church, all two of us. And we decided to do a party. We told Joyce about it. I told my mom. I said, Mom, can we do a party? Oh, absolutely. I'll make some lasagna. Okay, perfect. So mom was going to make food, you know, and... And, and then my friend Jimmy was going to get a cake, and his wife, they were going to bring a cake. We were just going to get all these people together, you know, and, and we were going to surprise them. So we got, we're all down, and it's all the downstairs in the basement of my house, right? And I go and pick him up. And, and he thinks I'm just taking him out to dinner again. And, and it was actually quite honestly, it was really pleasant. He was really pleasant. He doesn't know that I know that it's his birthday. But he's being really kind of sweet and nice and almost apologetic. And I'm like, oh, man, I forgot my wallet at home. Do you mind if we just swing by and get my wallet? And he's actually saying, I'll pay for it. I'm like, no, 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 no way. We're actually starting to have a little argument about who's going to pay for it. I'm a little worried about this, but finally he agrees. We drive to my house. And I said, why don't you come in with me real quick? And he goes, no, no, you go in. And I'm like, no, no, come on, come on in real quick. And he goes, all right, fine. So I go downstairs, and as I go downstairs, the lights are still dim. And I said, come on down here. He goes, well, turn on the lights. I said, all right, come on. So he comes down. As he comes down, I turn on the lights. Everybody goes, surprise. And Bob begins to tremble. Tears coming down his face. And he's sitting there going, for me? Really? Sergio? I said, come here, man. And he just started crying, Mom. He said, nobody has ever given me a birthday party. I said, you're loved, man. We love you. Bob got baptized just a few months later. And the last time I heard about Bob, he was going to a school to begin his journey to become a pastor in the church. That's the last time I heard about him. I mean, is that amazing or what? I mean, isn't it time that we change the way Christians are perceived? Isn't it time that we prove to the world that we are different from everybody else, that we truly accept, serve, and love as we say we do, that that is not only just some words that we have on the board, but it's something that we really are all about. Isn't it time? I mean, isn't it amazing to be able to know about Bob and, and, and to know that, that this, this man's life was saved. I may not see Bob again or hear about Bob again until I get to heaven, but I can't wait. And there are Bobs in every one of your lives. When was the last time that you ran to somebody and told them about how much you love Jesus and how much Jesus loves you? And it's not about us. We just sang. I don't want to leave a legacy. It's only Jesus, right? Paul tells us that love makes you patient. Beyond what other things is reasonable. Parents understand this, don't they? That love is kind. 
when kindness is or is not deserved. It is a thing of grace, requires nothing in return. Paul tells us that love, true love, does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It overcomes the self-centered nature. Paul tells us that love does not dishonor others, regardless of how dishonorable they may have behaved. Paul tells us that it is not self-seeking. It's not about my agenda, my politics, my skin, or my wants. It is totally kingdom-minded. Amen? Paul tells us that love is not easily angered. It doesn't take things personally. It listens with empathy. It keeps no record of wrong. It forgives. It lets go of resentment. It has an eye on the future. Paul tells us that love does not delight in evil, but always rejoices in the truth. It is totally addicted to authentic living. That's what love really is all about. It always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, it always perseveres. Amen? The Bible talks about three types of loves. It talks about a love that you have for your brothers. Like I, I love Brian who's walking up here. And that love, what the Bible calls philos. It's a philos love. And then there is a, another love. It's the kind of love that I have for my wife and only her. And that's called ethos. And as you read the Bible, it would be kind of nice to have like a vocabulary with you, a Bible vocabulary. Because sometimes it's using philos and sometimes it's using ethos. But then sometimes it uses another love. And it's a love that we don't understand and it is powerful. It's called agape love. Have you heard about agape love? And the Bible says, if you remember last week, we said that uh, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you what? Remain in me, and I in you, you will love. Can I, can I, can I cheat there for a moment? You will. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will will love like I want you to love and you will be loved like, like you deserve to be loved. And, and Paul puts it this way. He says, I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons neither the present nor the future nor any powers neither height nor depth nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the agape of God, from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. When Jesus died on the cross for the joy set before him, you guys, that was love. Jesus says, there is no greater love than a person who would lay down his life for them. That love is the love that Paul is talking about. It is a reckless love. It is an overwhelming, never-ending love. It's the kind of love, as the song we're about to sing says, chases us down, fights till we are found. It is willing to leave the 99 to find us. We don't earn it. We don't deserve it. But still God's love is victorious and wins. So stand with me as we sing this song together. Reckless love. been 
so, so good to me Before I took a breath You breathed your life in me Cause you have been so, so song just wrecks me every time, man. Beautiful. Beautifully sung, beautifully played. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, 
may we just take a hold of that love with reckless abandonment Lord may we love others may we give the world a picture of what Christianity really is and they know that you are my followers by the way you love that's what you said Jesus please put that love in us and help us to love each other that way every day in Jesus name I pray it amen have an awesome awesome Sabbath next week we talk about joy you're not going to want to miss that God bless you God bless you folks at home We'll see you next week.